Okay. Oh my god, this is one of my dreams to wear this microphone like this, you know? It's like, <laughs> but first of all, welcome to my, my, my house. <laughs> this, um, I, you know, this is really a big, you know, I use this room as a dining room, but today for this location, you know, I use this room for this. Um, great. Um, when Margaret asked me uh, to, uh, about two months ago, uh, Margaret asked me to uh, come to the Asian Art Museum, and um, I was so, you know, oh my god, this Teacher of the Year thing, it works. I finally, you know, uh, I'm going to be uh, the swing, I'm going to be put in the plastic case and, and then display at the Asian Art Museum. And then here it would say, like, you know, the first Japanese teacher to receive some work or something like that. But that, that's not the case yet. I'm working on it. Okay. Uh, so let's get started. Oh, before we start, uh, let's see. Um, this is my first uh, official uh, speech, so I need your support. Let's see your smile. Uh, he's not smiling. Okay, that's okay, good. And then whatever I say, even though it's not really mediocre, it's not that funny, you go, Woo! Let's practice, okay? Woo! Before we get started, one more thing. Um, today's topic, topic is Japanese Language Symposium. And uh, as a uh, national language teacher of the year, uh, my duty this year is to promote the uh, importance of language learning uh, in the States. And I'm going to address the Japanese program, uh, the issues and challenges or, uh, of Japanese program uh, within the framework of uh, foreign language, uh, overall foreign language teaching. Okay? All right. Uh, take a look. This is an art museum. This is my first time. I'm so excited. I love the arts. And here are some of the, uh, my favorite uh, paintings that I, I collected. And do you know any of them? Do you recognize them? They're kind of famous. Uh, yeah, a Botticelli from, I think, 1400. And that's, who's that by? Oksai. I think it's uh, uh, 1700, 1800, I think. And uh, this one is the screen. Moon? Is it Moon? Moon, okay. I think it's Norwegian. And then uh, Van Gogh, of course. And does anyone know that one? So that, yes. Bansky, that's right. Bansky, Bansky? Yeah, yeah. It's, from, uh, it's a famous uh, street artist uh, from Britain. All the arts, all the arts from different generations, different eras, different places, different countries, and with different techniques is presented here. But they have something in common. One thing in common. What are they trying to accomplish? What are they trying to convey through their arts? What is it? What do you think it is? I'm sorry. Feelings of the artist's feelings. And what else? Feelings. Yes. What is it? Message. Message. Yes, the artist must have message. And the message is usually reflected, is the reflection to the world. And have you heard the term, uh, teaching is art? If that's true, we are all artists. Well, some of you are not teachers, maybe. Uh, do we have artists in the house? Artists? Oh, okay, oh, one, two, three, five of them. Okay, okay, let's see. Uh, but, okay, uh, let's see. Teachers and artists have something in common. Teachers interpret the world and present their views and experiences through their work. They inspire and expand their students' horizons, helping them gain skills to access the world with resources. So we are teachers, are artists as well. So now, let me ask you, do we have artists in the house? Okay, great, more and more people, great, thank you. So, let's see. But sometimes we focus on teaching as simply uh, like a listening fact uh, or having students memorize a fact. But it's really, don't you think that teaching is really interpreting the world and presenting to the students and uh, help them gain skills to view the world? Now, having said that about the world, how can we learn or interpret the world without knowing the world? You know, nowadays with the internet and Facebook and all that, 
uh, people say the world is shrinking, the world is getting smaller, we are all better connected. Do you agree or disagree? Hmm. This is your first big pair share activity, okay? <laughs> we have only two big pair share, so this is one of them, okay? So talk to your neighbor, hopefully, ideally the person you don't know well, okay? Among yourself, among you, where you sit, think about, do you agree the world is getting smaller? Or disagree? Or maybe someone. Okay, we're gonna have uh, only 90 seconds. Okay, ready? Go. 90 seconds, about. Okay, let's see. A short hand. So, if you think it's shrinking, definitely shrinking. You know, back in the 60s, 60s, we have to actually write a letter to communicate with someone, you know, um, next town, perhaps. So, if you think it's shrinking, raise your hand. Okay, that's, that's quite a bit. Okay, it's almost 70%. Okay. Ooh, okay, if you think it's not, actually, it's not shrinking. Okay, raise your hand. Okay, okay. Minority, but it's interesting. There's, uh, okay, right here. <laughs> all, the pan all the panelists are thinking, no. So it kind of concerns me a little bit. But, um, including Consul uh, you know, General also. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so I would say 10%, okay, versus 70 okay, maybe some way, kind of middle, okay, 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 that was the choice there, yeah, okay, okay, they're changing their mind there. <laughs> but, I'll, okay, before I give you my um, thoughts, let's take a look at this interesting slide, I find it interesting. Here's the air traffic in 24 hours, it's each dot, each yellow dot um, represents the air plane going in and out countries. Huh. What can you tell from this? Interesting, huh? Isn't that interesting? What do you what do you notice? Go in Europe. They're going to Europe. <laughs> okay, they're going to Europe. Okay. Asia and the East Coast. Oh, not much West Coast happening there that day. Oh, it must have been Monday. I don't know. Just, I don't know. Oh, here we go. The daylight's coming in. Interesting, isn't it? So it kind of shows the distribution of the economy too. You know, um, I have a question for you. I'm a teacher, so I love to ask my students questions. And my first question for you, guess, what's the percentage of Americans with passports. Um, what's the percentage of Americans have passports? Okay, wait, 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 wait. You know, in the class, don't you? They, they just shut up. <laughs> oh, God, there's the, the teacher here. Okay, can I see your hand, please? Uh, yes. 30% and what else? Yes. 20. 20. Ooh, that's a little. Well, okay, uh, yes. 10? Oh, 20. Okay, I thought it was a little yeah, pessimistic about that. 20, 30, okay, what else? Anything? Okay, the answer, the answer is 30. There's no prize for you, okay. But 30%, does this surprise you? Or are you kind of like, oh, you agree? 30%, and then I also got that, some information. Out of that 30%, 50% of that travel is to Mexico or Canada. I know, I love the dress. Uh, uh, yeah. I know, what does that tell us? So it's down to 15%. You know, first of all, 30% of Americans have their pa passports so they can go in and out and experience other cultures, right? What happens at the 70%? Hmm, think about that. 70% of Americans, when they get their world views, where do they get? Media? Fox News, did you say? Oh, uh, okay. Textbook. Oh, that little young lady. Textbook and media. Interesting. Huh, that's what you think, huh? Media. Did you say media? Mm. So you think we have more coverage about world news now? Let's find out. I'll be quiet. I'll have you look at the chart. Actually, major media of ABC and ABC of the major media covered more back in the 70s than they do now. Isn't that interesting? 
So, so media is not doing the job. Media is not, you know, uh, sharing the information of the world. So, when they get the information, hmm. internet, you said, hmm, interesting. Internet? What else? Language teachers. <laughs> okay, just a good answer. Yeah, that was good, my, my answer. But pretend that I didn't really get out. Okay, so what else did we get that? Okay. So um, that's the fact. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, where do we get it? It's our job, exactly. Language teachers. We, our role is crucial. If we don't bring Japan, our okay, case, my guess is Japan, to our classroom, no one does. So we cannot assume that, oh, they have an iPad, they have a computer, they get information. No, most of the time, information we see online or news, we don't know what to think about. What, we don't know what to do with. Okay, those are facts. Facts are listed. We look at the facts, but most of the time we don't know what they mean, really, do we? So, uh, teachers are not replaceable. We cannot be replaced. We have to do our job. And um, the, uh, how does one broaden one's perspective, word views? To answer that, I'd like to take you to a uh, short trip to Okinawa. Okay? I'll show you an example of how one kid did it. Okay? Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. Uh, let's see. Are you, are you ready? Have you been to Okinawa before? Oh, wow. It's more than, wow. Any Okinawa? Oh, no, no one. Oh, no one? Okay. I'm the only one. Okay. Fine. So I can say whatever. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, buckle up. I'm taking to Okinawa now. This is where we are. And are you buckling up? I don't hear your buckle. Thank you. Thank you. That's Okinawa right there. My little, little island. Okinawa. Okinawa is like 67 miles long and 1.4 million people live there. It's located in the south of Japan. Uh, it's just tropical island. It's more of like a Hawaii to the mainland. And Okinawa has an interesting history. And Okinawa was a kingdom for a long time. And in 1700, it became part of Japan. And after the World War II, uh, it was occupied uh, by the U.S. for 25 years. And it was returned to Japan in uh, 1972, when I was three years old. Well, that'll give you some idea where I came from. OK, are you ready for this? Next slide, I'm really nervous, but um, I'll do it anyway. OK, I'm the show. There you go. <laughs> Oh uh, my, I was, in that picture, I was, in that picture, I was like um, 18, I don't know, no, I was like a three or something, a little chubby, uh, me, chubby yo, uh, that's an actual picture of Okinawa, that's what it looks like, it's beautiful, yeah, beautiful island, and I was born in, and raised in Okinawa, uh, again, I was born in 1969, what an awesome time, um, I grew up listening to Okinawan music, learning Okinawan dance, and eating Okinawan food. Okay? And listening to Okinawan music. Like that. That's That's now, at school, of course, I received education now in Japanese, Japanese education, and a lot of Japanese culture, of course, and a lot of Japanese, you know, uh, anime comics and stuff like that. I just loved it. I just loved it. And uh, let's see, and at school, uh, we were, uh, we had to learn Japanese, of course, at home, uh, I would speak Okinawan. But at school, we were not we were forbidden to speak Okinawan. I remember when I was in third grade, I spoke Okinawan something, I yelled at something, and they, I had to wear a tag, you know, and just stand in front of the classroom, you know, like this. So it kind of like, that made me, made me think about, oh, Japanese, that's a strong, powerful thing. We have to learn Japanese to become successful. So, and what made the Okinawa experience more unique was American presence. It's fun. How many of you know this? Okay. If you know, BGs, you're dating yourself, okay? So BGs, and of course, a huge military presence, and family circus. Family circus. I, 
I, I was seven years old, family circle, I had no idea what I was saying, but I looked at the picture, the makeup stories, you know, it's, the American culture was always there, strong. And Sam, Sam, you cannot talk about Okinawa okay, without Sam, okay? So I grew up with Sam you know, a lot. And of course, listen to me, oh, of course, dairy cream ice cream. So, this gives you some idea of my background. I was born to Okinawa family, I go to school in Japanese, and I, uh, my, I, spend some, uh, I go out and play with my American friends that live nearby my house. So that was the kind of complex I've come from. So quickly I realized that the uh, coast, uh, in each culture, each culture has its own distinct, uh, distinct uh, coast. So I started kind of maneuvering around. So I, I started enjoying watching people, how they react uh, among Okinawans, among Japanese, and among Americans, and it's by like the three cultures going in there. Uh, so as a kid, I'm looking at it, so I thought it was kind of fascinating thing. And they, it made me want to come to this country. I want to learn about America more. So maybe for a reason that, because America was so different, I was attracted to it, I'm more interested in it. And I was a troubled child when I was 15. My mother did everything to get rid of me. So that summer, <laughs> one summer, my mother came home and said, hey, um, you said you wanted to go to America, right? I said, yeah. Maybe I said it like, yeah. Maybe I said it like that. And then, <laughs> that's more accurate. And uh, so, oh, you're going? Really? What? Sunday. <laughs> Mom, it's Wednesday. Sunday? Oh, don't worry. I got your passport, everything. You're going. 15 year old. My English was really minimal. And um, so I was shipped to Seattle for summer. And uh, so I had to, I didn't speak a word of English or nothing. Actually, I didn't speak a word for one week because I was so afraid I couldn't communicate. You know, like I would take a shower, actually talking to myself in the shower. You know, you know that's, that's what I did, how I had to do to survive. And then, but quickly I learned that I gotta learn the language. I gotta learn the culture. So, but three months after that, I made friends, American friends, and I didn't want to go back to Okinawa anymore. So, like, so that's that made me kind of open up my worldview, and that really changed my life forever. So, uh, that's that's the Okinawa uh, story. So, um, what's your story? What what what? To me, the language learning is very, very important for that reason too. It's almost like discovering myself. I used to think that's like adding another skill, but after that, it's almost like discovering a different part of me. Oh, I had that part. Something that I always had, but didn't know about. But learning, only learning a language and culture could open that part of me. So that's why I feel strongly about um, the language learning and cultural learning. Etc. So, um, what's your opinion? What are the benefits of language learning? Okay. Uh, but what are the benefits of learning language and culture in your mind? Okay. This is the second think pair, er, uh, think pair share activity. Okay. This is the last one. I promise. So, okay. you talk to your neighbor, and what to you? you what are the benefits? What are the benefits of uh, learning a language and culture? And this time I'll give you one, two minutes. Okay. I then share back. This time I'll share back. Okay, ready? Go. This was the question for uh, the teacher of the year uh, portfolio. And uh, so, yeah, it was a simple question, but I really have to come, I have to dig in within me. It's not, if I can say, oh, it's important to communicate with others, okay? But it's kind of scratch the surface. But I really have to go down the, to find the true reason why. So why uh, the language learning and cultural uh, uh, education is important. So I thought that was a short, like two, three minutes, you know, a short, I know uh, it's a short time, but um, would you like to share some of that? Yes, yes, speak loud, please. Yes. Did you know 50% of the students um, come at school with second language or a different culture, I mean, uh, 
second line is already in California. So 50%, that's significant. We have built the resources. To me, as a Japanese citizen, the best quality of America, America is the diversity. See, that's something that's different in Japan. But here, with the diversity, all the resources are here already. But are we utilizing them? Are we acknowledging their contribution? Are we giving them power or taking our way the power from them? So we have to resource this already. Thank you. Yes, this uh, should start early on. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, anyone? That's a good one. Yes. I think that it, it kind of like opens up the student's mind and makes them smarter and more like open and then it's easier to learn because then that part of your mind is already like available for more learning. So it's like instead of only using say 10% of your brain, I don't know, making up a random number, then you use something more like 15 or 20% instead. Well at, said. At least more. You know what? It's true. Um, I'm reading a book called the uh, Bubble No More. Are, are you, is, any, of you, any of you reading it? It's about uh, polyglots, uh, people who speak more than, I think, definition was more than six languages fluently. So that's polyglots, I have that one. So it, it talks about that brain part of it. So yes, it does make us smarter. Oh my God, can you imagine if we didn't speak a second language? What would have we been? Like, you know, we would be like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's really it's good for our brain. Yes. It's, and then uh, study shows that, also shows that um, uh, people who speak more than one language are able to uh, process diverse information and make greater meaning of what they are learning. You said, you said it. So you can apply that. It's not from the language itself, but that too, but the, in the process, they, um, they gain this ability to comprehend other subjects or other other areas of our life. So, what else? Why is it important? Why? The common thing is jobs. Okay, job security. Okay, future jobs. And what else? Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> there are, yes, go ahead. I think it's a um, means to empower certain communities that while um, it can, it can, encourage more people um, if, and also you can see while there are certain ways to express yourself in one language so you can it might be discovery um, also that while there are differences in the languages we also have this sort of universal there are common things as well so just all in all a means to empower yes. students yes it's, it's we, we had this discussion in my class, it was so interesting. Yesterday I was practicing this presentation with my students, right, of course. If it works for them, it should work with teachers, right? So I tried that, and one kid, oh my god, I almost cried. But I tell you, I, my student teacher was there in class, and she said, um, uh, what's it, a culture. I said I could have provoked them. What, what, we can read about culture, right? So that was my provoking question. And <laughs> Christina, she said, no. You can read about it, but you put it away, and that's it. And that's someone, someone else's view. It's not your view. That's what the kids said. You just read about someone else's view, but it's not your view. <gasps> right. <laughs> right. All the reading, cultural reading, uh, there's a limitation. You can read about it and put the book away, that's it. There's no connection here. We can only make that happen through learning the language. It's not just reading about the culture. but. Through learning, uh, language learning, we acquire culture. We, so that's the only way we can make a strong connection. Like I, conviction that I had was when I started learning English, um, I, I knew and I'm feeling I was connected to Americans. I cried when the 9-11 happened and I could cry with them. You know, I could feel, not so much here, but I could feel their feeling, what they're going through and the joy and whatnot. So that is a strong connection, yes, that we have to make, yes. I think with that, it also um, breeds tolerance and compassion. Yes. It's even deeper and more long-term. It is not only just the language, but like you said, when you had that um, feeling when 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. you, um, that brought about a sense of compassion. Right. And 
then also a tolerance for yeah. a variety of cultures. Yeah, thank you. So basically, we want the world to be a peaceful place. We want people like us, right? Well, kind of. Okay, so we want people like us, or like me. I want to be, I want to spend, you know, time with me. Uh, let's see. So, oh, that was the easiest song. Okay. Um, so here, flexibility and creativity in thinking. It's the research. Time and time shows that people who speak uh, more, people who have more exposure to learning languages and culture have a wider scope of creativity and mental flexibility. It's true. I didn't make this up. Okay. And neural pathways, like Jessica mentioned, okay, uh, they can process uh, diverse information better. So that, and then that's partially because you have more uh, place to draw information upon that you can connect to. And job opportunities. Last week, I was reading a uh, Huffington Post about a uh, new graduate uh, uh, job uh, rate has gone down. Did you read the article? And my, uh, the, it, that's the lowest. That's lowest in 60 years, I believe. That's like 60 years. I mean, job, I mean new hiring for uh, young people. So that's the lowest in 60 years. So then I thought, did they join the international market? Did they try other countries or the, co the other countries, co you know, companies that exist here, perhaps? Then I thought, wait a minute, no, no, they can't. Because only 15.5% of U.S. students enroll in foreign language program. Less than 20%, less than 16% of uh, U.S. students are enrolled in foreign language program. Can you believe this? And we are trying to compete with other countries? I don't know, something is disconnected right there. So, um, so uh, yes, the last one is unlocking one's own potential. That's, um, I think um, that happened to me, I, that's how I, what I experienced. And, and it's not so much that I added on new skill, but it's kind of like a made me discover, oh, I had that part of me, inside of me. It's kind of activated. So that was an eye-opening experience. And with that, I can um, relate to the Americans, and I can uh, relate to uh, people beyond the world. So uh, those are the reasons, the benefits of um, learning languages and cultures. Uh, there are more too, but those are kind of highlights that I want to share today. And um, I was questioning, so if I address this, and then I should naturally address the uh, solution. How do we get there, kind of thing. So I came up with this. Hope you like it. Oh, these are my students. Um, uh, three E's. E's. E means good in J Japanese too. So I'm kind of okay. Okay, is it going? Okay. E. Okay, three E's for global citizen for the 21st century. First E. Explore. Let's explore. Explore part. So student or teacher. Teachers need to explore. Teaching is to read a book and research and acquire new skills, and that's explore. Yeah, exploring. And uh, students do, do, do that too, of course. And it's quick. Teachers can learn, attend professional development, uh, pick up a new skill, and learn another language, uh, learn a jazz piano like me, you know? So it's quick. And then, the last one is evolve. So we can evolve to the new uh, global citizens that we can be. And uh, we can share that with the community as well. Um, the future is not, I heard that uh, someone said the future is not uh, something that we wait for, uh, it's something we create. So we're here to create our future, and we must start now here. We must educate our students, uh, we teach, to bring culture to our classroom, and get them ready for the 21st century. Thank you. Okay, so we started with the uh, idea, the first art piece that I wanted 
uh, for example, with artists and teachers' connection. We have to be the artists. It's not the job, it's just the job. We are artists. We are flexible with the students and the teaching assignments and whatnot. So, yes, there's a question. Let's go ahead. I'm sorry, could you tell us what the population of kids in your Japanese classes is at your high school? Yes. Uh, the Title I school that I teach, and also uh, the population, I think 75% uh, uh, Mexican descent, uh, and also 25% 25, 25 uh, Filipino, and the other is the rest. Yeah, so that's the population. And a lot of uh, students come from agricultural background as well. So lettuce, probably the lettuce you had this morning came from Poland. <laughs> yes, what else? Culture and language go hand in hand, and it's really hard to teach just one without teaching the other. And how do you find the good balance of teaching culture? Like when I teach language, I always get sidetracked and talk about the culture. And you know, I just always want to you know hear what other great teachers do. Yes. You know, my opinion, yes, culture and language, you cannot separate them. You cannot just teach language, or you cannot teach culture. Thank you, go hand in hand together. This is how we start. I always start with a goal in mind. Like in my case, let's say, uh, pick a theme, like uh, we're working on school or something. And then within the school theme, we brainstorm uh, cultural products and practices. So a lot of things, uh, the school uh, schedule to around the city the back to all the same cultural products and cultural practice, people you know, get up and bow and that kind of thing. So I bring some of those things, and I cannot possibly address everything, but then I choose which cultures to address, which culture that I think that my students should know. So then go from there. And I'll definitely, uh, because I'm, I, in the past when I started teaching uh, earlier in my career, I, had this, I was working on this house unit for three months. <laughs> it would go on and on and on and on, and I talked to my master teacher at that time, I said, oh, God, I don't think my kids are learning. It's like it's three months. I could have built a house by now. <laughs> Actually, I, so I talked about that. And then he said, what's your goal? What do you mean? Well, can your kids uh, describe the house? Yeah. Can they do this? Yeah. Yeah. So then maybe they make the goal. You don't, if you don't have the goal, we don't know where we're heading. So oftentimes, we get discouraged. We work hard. We work hard to make activities, make it fun. But without the goal, it's not going to take us anywhere. So that's my advice. The goal setting is really crucial. Yeah. That's a practical question. Yes? How do you see how we incorporate culture into language teaching? And uh, you said earlier you were in San Francisco, you were teaching San Francisco. Yes. And now in Salinas, it's over 40, 50% of students are. Um, uh, seven, yes. Yeah, okay. So you see yourself to apply those their culture versus Japanese. And uh, for example, San Francisco, we, like depending on the school, but 80% of the students are Asian. And then we have to consider their culture as well. So sometimes Japanese and um, Japanese culture and Asian culture, so in a way, it's similar. It's, it's easier to handle. But when you teach Hispanic culture, I'm not going to stereotype or prejudice or anything. Just the difference, you have to appreciate that and you have to incorporate there. Goodness to Japanese culture, how do you make an effort um, when you teach? A practical sense, like a lower level, um, uh, because their, their language skill is still you know, low. So we can start by just listening to stuff. Just that can be a comparison. Like a, what do you find in Japanese classroom, this American classroom, or uh, you know, this comparison, like a simple comparison like that? And the language would be like a Nihon no Kyoshi niwa Kokuban, Kyodan ga arimasu, American no Kyoshi niwa Nani mo arimasen. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say stuff like that. So like simple like that, you know, comparison. It's not a full, you know, uh, and then also gradually. 
looking at Asia for bear. Of course, it has to be Asia for bear. Something they are interested in. And, um, so you start. You have to start with that. Otherwise, difficult concept. I try to do it fail because then I have to question myself: Is this really important? Is it? You know. So then. Um, uh, so I don't know if I can answer your question, but uh, that's um, you know, with it, I don't see the difference whether it's a Japanese, um, uh, you know, uh, or Asian background, the kids with a Asian background, or Mexican descent, or I, I, I don't see the distinguish uh, in that sense. But speaking of that, I made me realize I, I think just mentioned about Japanese. You know, here's here's why Japanese is good. Japanese is considered to be uh, the most difficult language for Americans to acquire. It's, it's, I didn't make it up, but it's a DLI, Defense Language Institute, that said that. So that means, I'll start, start with that in my class, actually, first day. <laughs> Syllabus, facts, Japanese is the most trivial language. Did it discourage them? No, not necessarily, because, because it's the most difficult language, it does a lot to their brain. See, they get the best out of that. So, uh, the, the, the new ones we're talking about, the newer pathways are connecting. And people used to think the brain, just this part is a language, but it's not. The recent discovery shows that all parts, people are using different parts of the brain to understand um, uh, language. So Japanese is the best, because that's the most difficult language. <laughs> it's good for your brain, and uh, you can order sushi too. Yeah, so, <laughs> that's, that's good. And, and, yes? teach the foreign language, I sometimes feel frustrated as an instructor if they have to learn English before they learn foreign language. And in your case, do you have similar problem like a student have difficulty in English first and then in that case, what kind of effort do you make? That's very interesting. Yes, we do have um, some, I don't know what the percentage in the community knows, but she's my student teacher. So we have a number for Yelp. We, 20% of, the, I think a little less than maybe 20% of uh, students, uh, ELB uh, students, and uh, I'm sure you've experienced this before too. They do so well. Because Japanese is something they started from zero. It's no background, nothing. I mean, in my case, um, I don't have, I only have one or two, two uh, Japanese, they're not even heritage speakers, with Japanese, students with Japanese last name, let's put it that way. So, like, <laughs> okay, they're not heritage speakers. So like I don't basically I have no Japanese speaking kids, and um, so uh, no uh, the people who, who are learning English at the same same time I don't uh, I think uh, they uh, more than anything they, they feel encouraged this is the class that they can shine and they can do well so that's my experience I'm sure many people agree with that yes Lisa. I just yeah. wanted to reiterate that. Yeah. It definitely. It's true. And we, we love that. We, we love to see that moment. That is. It's the yeah. spark that keeps us motivated. So. Yes. Okay. Oh, Lisa, was, uh, Lisa would you repeat that? Just, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to reiterate what Azama Sensei was saying, that um, I have a student who is African American and she is a child with um, some learning differences, but her love is Japanese. She loves Nihongo and she excels at it. And that's the thing that kind of keeps her motivated. One more question. Some question that you cannot sleep without. Oh, two, can I, can I have two? Two more, please? Yeah, they, they, their hands went up. Same time. I, I, I so first and second. Oh, first, and second. Yeah, ladies first. Hi, um, I have a question. Uh, two questions. Uh, a little one question. Two. How how long have you been teaching? How long have you been teaching at Salinas High School? Uh, so it's high, uh, no, it's high School. Uh, no, it's High School. Let's see, 12, 13 years. Great. Yes. Um, about five years ago, when I was in the single subject credential program, I watched a video of you teaching travel unit um, teaching 
um, students um, or divide into groups and they create their travel brochures mm -hmm. and that was very, uh, very, very uh, motivating for me oh, to I become like a teacher. That. So now I'm a I teacher like now. <laughs> yeah, I was very yeah, impressed with your teaching. Thank but. you. One more? Yeah. I'll give you one more. Ah, that, that's, yeah. that was the, I, I wanted to make sure that was you. That was the oh, first one. Right. And then I was <laughs> So that was, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Not really. <laughs> okay. Ah, one over there and the one here. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, let's see. How do you inspire those, uh, you know, Hispanic students when they don't seem to have much of connections to Japanese, uh, Japanese or Japanese culture or Japanese? Let's see. You know, when they grow up, they want to have something like a economic connections or a finding job and then they, they live in Osaka, Salinas, Salinas. Salinas. Yeah. and then a farming community and then uh, at this point though at, uh, you know when they are taking Japanese classes they don't seem to have much of the uh, future connection the, how do you inspire them you know how do you show them you know when you learn the language then uh, they can find a job but how, you know, how do you inspire them? Yeah. That's my question, I guess. Well, um, I think uh, people, students usually sign up for Japanese too, right? So there, there, there's a reason. I mean, usually they have their own reason, like uh, uh, Council General mentioned, like anime or, you know, some personal uh, thing there too. But there are a lot of people. people I noticed most of my kids are, not really interested in anime. Well, only a few groups, small group, I noticed that. Maybe you agree, you're not in. But a majority of the group, uh, people are either college, a job opportunity, or college, and just simply like to challenge uh, themselves. And uh, and they also hear that, oh, they play games, it's fun, let's go there, or you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. But, um, but I think the important part is, um, uh, I think uh, uh, to inspire them, like uh, like I was inspired uh, by American culture. I was fascinated by it, and no one forced me uh, to learn English or anything. But it's a natural thing, and then I knew that 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 would benefit me in the future somehow. I, would connect. I knew that I knew that that would benefit not for the job sake, but I knew that would open up the door for me. Uh, either not only the door for a uh, uh, career. But uh, door for my personal enrichment, and uh, so uh, I like uh, to see that my, happening to my students as well. Uh, when they make that connection, uh, you can kind of tell. They, they, they determine. They will start asking questions, or you know, they bring textbooks. You know, even though they didn't, I didn't ask them to bring them. You know, asking questions and stuff like that. When that happens, then I'm, I'm just happy. Uh, yeah, I would like to see that happen. Yes, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm sorry for one more. Uh, this actually, uh, this Japanese language specific question. I wonder. Uh, recently, a lot of the school in California stopped uh, quite uh, stopped teaching J Japanese, and then I understand that there is no point to compete each other with the other language. But at the same time, I, I wonder, if, do you have any thoughts or idea yeah. on how we can, how teacher or how people involved in this, you know, environment, we can, you know, what we can do or what you plan to do? That's a very, uh, very uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've been, of course, I've been thinking about, I've been hearing that, you know, programs are closing here and there, and, you know, that's, that's what's happening. But did you, well, First of all, uh, you know, uh, there are 7,000 languages in the world, exist, and every two weeks we lose one, one language is disappearing. So that means uh, the culture and then wisdom and everything is disappearing, every two weeks, one language, 7,000, you can do the math. Okay. And uh, English seems to be the uh, language, only language that be uh, spoken by non-native speakers, more non-native speakers who speak English compared uh, than, than native speakers in English. So that's what's happening already. So in this to answer that, 
So every single language to me, every single language, either it's Japanese or Spanish, Chinese, French, those are critical languages. So people start calling critical languages like, oh, uh, uh, Chinese or Arabic or critical language. But to, to, to us, we should think of each language as a critical language. And if we can increase the number of 18.5% and currently enrolled in the Japanese form in the United States, that we are, we are fighting for this small number of people. When that number goes up, 70%, I'll think 60, I'll be happy. 60% of people, then uh, more language uh, should be offered. There's a possibility it should be offered too. And more the diverse, the more, the more the modern language society we become, I think that's a strength to us. And that's what we need. We need awareness. Uh, sometimes it's, it's hard because we work hard to make our program go, but still uh, cuts will happen because the economy and so I don't have the magic board to you know, fix this answer. I don't. I'm not going to pretend. But if we step back and look at a different view, like, you know, there are only two of them are enrolled in life. What if the number goes up? Okay? So uh, is it possible? Is it possible uh, that? Um, more people will take it. There are a variety of languages, so it's not fighting. It is a shame that it's, it's become like a fighting kind of a situation that I don't want to, because this is a time that we should kind of like, um, I'm not dreaming, but you know, it's not dreaming, but this is a time that we should really, as a foreign language community, get together strong and uh, put this you know, agenda forward. So that's why I'm hoping to uh, meet with Mr. Obama. And um, they are actual, they are making a connection. Make a connection. Um, I will reply, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, yeah, that is a very big deal. And then we're going to uh, talk about that in the panel discussion. And um, so. Yeah. with us so you can ask him questions I know that this kind of a question and answer starts slowly and uh, picks up so the communication is getting very interesting right now but I have to uh, stop here so thank you Azama Sensei again for your great speech <laughs>